and then so that means that we're all we're all going live and we'll have this recording later on today i'll send it out to everyone and uh you can check in uh, on it uh for about a week we'll have it up so i see there's a lot of other questions here in the chat i probably won't get to all this uh, but just one that i'll touch on really quick before i uh, put my PowerPoint on. Uh, someone had a question about the effect of the bighorn fire that uh, the effect that it has on birds and other wildlife. So I won't be hitting on that during this presentation, but uh, we do have a, um, a biologist from the U of A, a uh, professor there, who is going to speak on uh, the effects of wildfire and its suppression. Uh, on um it has to do with bighorn fire but he, he, he yeah well any, i lost my track of thought but anyway he stephen smith is his name that's what i was trying to remember professor stephen smith from the u of a and he's going to talk on the effects of wildfire here in a couple of weeks so just go on to our uh website i'll send you the link later on today and you can sign up for that class he'll be able to fill in on that Okay, let me go to share our screen. So let me get there. Um, you know, what, when people think about Tucson, Southeast Arizona, when to come visit here, uh, normally they're not thinking about coming and birding here or visiting here um, in the middle of summer. They think about coming here December, January, February, maybe March, and then they head out because they want to miss the, the hot the hot weather, the 100 degree temperatures. So I can understand that a little bit. You know, maybe some of you are snowbirds. You come here uh, in the winter from Wisconsin or Washington, and then you go back up to Wisconsin, Washington over the summer. What I would say is that People who are not birding here in the summer miss out on the greatest time of birding um, in Tucson. And every time that I talk about our festival of people, they're always um, very uh, interested or intrigued as to why we have our festival in August. Well, because for most people, they, they see it this, this way. This is uh, something that one of my friends sent me called the, the birder's year. And, you know, it starts off pretty high and then March, it kind of goes down a little bit, uh, just waiting for spring migration to come up. This is kind of from an Eastern perspective. You know, everyone's totally excited about the spring migration. And then during the summer, it really slows down and it picks up again for fall. Well, if I was going to be putting together a graph like this for, for us here in Tucson, there'd be a, a huge spike right here in July, August. And why is that? Well, the main reason is this right here. You're looking at uh, a monsoon that's outside of Sierra Vista. Uh, that took this picture by Brown Canyon uh, coming down from Ramsey Canyon uh, a few years ago. But it's, it's, and we haven't had a whole lot of these monsoons yet this year, so I'm hoping they're coming soon. But there's something about uh, all this rain that we get during this uh, July, August time period of our monsoons that just makes everything totally green. So this is a picture uh, from our festival a couple of years ago. And uh, probably it looks like maybe Box Canyon or something similar to that, maybe down in the uh, Atascosas or the Pajaritos, but um, you can just see how green it looks. This is the time of year, August, that's the greenest you'll ever see uh, the desert. And when the, uh, the agaves will start blooming, all the hummingbirds come out. So like August is just like an amazing time for hummingbirds. You have fall migration that's kicking in and people, uh, and you know, all the, uh, uh, not just hummingbirds, but flycatchers, lazuli buntings, painted buntings, grosbeaks, um, tanagers, orioles. You got all this warblers, all this movement coming from the more northern latitudes that are coming into um, the southeast Arizona region um, because there's a lot of food resources here. 
And so not only migration, not only the monsoons and the, you know, the second breeding season, but also for some of those birds like in West Texas or New Mexico or Colorado, even California, that there's some post-breeding dispersal that happens. So they go through their breeding cycle in May, June, July. And then uh, as they, you know, head out from their nesting area, they're looking for food resources. So all that food is here. So it's not like real like migration, like they're not headed all the way south, but they move west or they move east or they move just a little south. And they just park themselves here for a month or two with August being right in the middle of that. And so it's actually, if you're gonna be doing a, a big day, most big days around the country are going to be happening in, in May, maybe April. Uh, and April, May is, is good for here too, but August really has the potential to have uh, the most species that you can find in Tucson at any time throughout the year. And that, that idea of, of birding in the desert, or I mean, it's not all desert, but the idea of birding somewhere where it's super hot in the middle of summer just is something that, you know, a lot of us don't think about. So I just want to emphasize how great this month is. Um, June is probably the hardest month because it's the driest month uh, and it's, you know, most of the migration is all over. Uh, then July is kind of that bridge month. We're kind of right at the moment where it's starting to get good again, and August is just amazing. So I wanted to share a few different uh, specific spots for you to go and to explore in August. It was really hard to determine which locations to talk about because, like I said, there are so many great spots to bird in August here around here. So you can't really go wrong whether, you know, you. You go down to Sycamore Canyon or California Gulch, California Gulch in the Atascosas of Paritos, or you go, um, you know, Saguaro National Park, like some people mentioned that with the Purple Martins can be a good spot in August, you know, it's just so green. There's lots of cost of hummingbirds out there. You could go, you know, into the Patagonia area. I'm not going to touch on that at all, but Patagonia and the, and, uh, the Harshaw Creek area is just amazing as well. So can't touch on everything and that's okay. Um, but I'm gonna touch on some of my favorites for the month of August. And really uh, it starts with hummingbirds. So the hummingbird migration is coming through, all the flowers are blooming. And so it's just like everything pops. It's also the time of year when we get the most exotic hummingbirds that come up. We've already been been starting to see this a bit with like this white-eared hummingbird that's right here uh, that we're looking at. Uh, bear line hummingbird has been at Santa Rita Lodge for a while. There's been a couple plain cap star throats that have shown up uh, this month, um, which as you'll see, I, I was pretty excited about because at the end of each of these birding by month uh, courses or classes or sessions or whatever we call them, I kind of pick a bird, you know, rare bird for the month. For July, it was plain cap star throat. So I was glad that a couple got reported. Uh, that's one to also look for as we go in August. Uh, the hummingbirds is just where it's at. Um, it's an awesome time to see them. So I want to focus on two different spots for hummingbirds. Um, and both of them happen to be just south of Sierra Vista. Uh, one is Beatty's Guest Ranch, which is in Carr Canyon. And the other is Ash Canyon Bird Sanctuary. It used to be uh, Mary Jo's uh, like bed and breakfast, but Mary, uh, when Mary Jo passed away uh, last year, the Southeast Arizona Bird Observatory was able to uh, purchase that property with the help of some, uh, many donors and uh, renamed that and uh, to Ash Canyon Bird Sanctuary. We'll talk a little bit more about that as we go into that, but. Uh, this whole area right here below Sierra Vista, these are the Wadachuca Mountains. You got the, the, the base that's up here that you can go and check out. Uh, lots of good canyons up there for trogans and for I mean, hummingbirds up there too. 
I didn't explore that area as much, but as you come down here, you have Ramsey Canyon, which is, I, I would have talked about that um, here as well, but it's still closed because of COVID. Uh, and then down here you have uh, Miller Canyon and Ash Canyon. I'm gonna um, share my screen. Uh, uh, let's see, before we get to that, let's, uh, I'm gonna switch to a new share and I'm gonna show you a map of, of how to get to Beatty's. Let me get to it here. Uh, so here's, here's the Google map right here of Sierra Vista. And um, so the first spot that we'll look at is Beatty's Guest Ranch. And it's in Miller Canyon. So if you just start coming down into Sierra Vista, you see Miller Peak right here. This road right here, I'm gonna go in a little bit more. This is Miller Canyon Road. I believe that's it, yep, Miller Canyon Road. And um, the first part of it is paved, but then it turns into gravel right around here. And you don't need four wheel drive or high access. Uh, it may look like it's uh, in some areas not a great road, but if you just take your take it slow, any type of car can get all the way in here. You'll pass a couple different parking areas for trailheads through here. And it's about maybe two miles on a gravel road. And you just go to the very end of it. You see right here, Miller Canyon Upper Parking. And this is where you'll park. This whole green area right here is right here, Beatty's Guest Ranch. You'll park at this little parking area right here. And then you just walk up this road and you'll see the Guest Ranch here. And um, there's, you'll see a, a spot where you can put in uh, $5 for their sugar fund. And uh, let's, let's actually go to satellite. You can see the parking area right here. And then you just kind of walk up this road. There's a little creek that runs through here. And you'll pass uh, some chickens. They have a bunch of dogs. Uh, so you may hear the dogs barking. Don't be alarmed by that. They're actually super nice dogs. And then uh, there'll be a, there's a little gate that comes through here. You'll see the signs that point you to where to go for the bleacher uh, sitting. So it's pretty, it's a, pretty easy spot to get to it's a little awkward a little weird because you know you're it's not someone's backyard but it feels like you're walking through maybe an area like am I really supposed to go up this way but yeah just keep on going up that way and it's a beautiful area there, there's lots of good birds through here too western wood peewee canyon towhee scott's oriole stuff like that and um I'm gonna go back to the PowerPoint here. Oh, whoop. that's not the one I want to go to. Sorry about that. All right, there we go. And um, so it's it's very easy birding. That's one thing that I think a lot of us like about looking for hummingbirds is that we can just sit. This is my wife right here. We actually went there on Saturday, so I wanted to get some fresh pictures. <laughs> and uh, so we, there's a couple other folks that came through while we were there, but right here we're by ourselves and just sitting on these bleachers and she's posing there for us. And this is what you're looking out at. You're looking at uh, some different hummingbird feeders through here. There's some more over here on the left. There's probably one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, there's probably like nine or 10 different hummingbird feeders through here. And they're, the hummingbirds are just zooming around all over the place. It's really easy. You just sit there and they'll come to you. So like if, you, if you're not a hiker, if you don't want to go uh, walk very far, if you just want to sit there and have, you know, uh, just take your time, this is a spot to do it. And there's tons of different hummingbirds that come through here. It's a little higher elevation. It's not real high elevation, but it is high enough for like Rivoli's hummingbirds and maybe a blue-throated mountain gem. I didn't see any blue-throated mountain gem when I was there uh, on Saturday, but uh, there is very possible, especially in August. Uh, this is the specialty bird of Beatty's Guest Ranch is, it's the best spot around here for white-eared hummingbird. 
and uh, there are a couple that have been there for maybe the past month or so, and they should stick around all through August. And the numbers of hummingbirds that'll be there will just increase as August approaches. And it took, uh, we were there probably for about 40 minutes or so before the white-eared hummingbird actually showed up. And what's interesting is after that 30, 40 minutes, it kept on coming back and forth. In fact, we saw two different white-eared hummingbirds. You can see this one is a bright, fresh male with the really black under the throat, black forehead, and that huge white eye stripe. That eye stripe really sticks out. You can see on this one, see how this is like a young male or uh, – yeah, I think it's a young male. See, it would, the other one was like much more black under the throat and the black crown. So it was cool to be able to see two different ones. But you can see on this one how the, the white really sticks out big time right there on, on him too. And so what you want to be careful of, just something that, to be mindful of, is that um, broad-billed hummingbirds can have a bit of that white stripe as well. You can see this one's just you can barely see that white stripe above her eye. This is a female broadbill. But there are some female broadbills and some young male broadbills that'll have the, like a pretty good white eye line that can kind of throw you for a loop a little bit. And you might think, oh, I think that was a white eared, but I'm not sure. And so what I would say is you'll know when you see a white eared, like it just pops. It's, it's really cool to see that, that, that bird and uh, there's a lot of these broad builds that'll try to fool you but don't don't let that happen it happens to a lot of us I know it's happened to me before there was one female broad build that I didn't get a picture of but I swore I like oh man I I thought that was white eared and uh, it was before we actually saw the white eared <laughs> it just rem I was glad to have that reminder of Luke slow down don't think that you see uh, a white eared every time you see a female broad build. Uh, you'll know it when you see it. And so it certainly showed up. So just be aware of that. But there's uh, a few different hummingbirds to be looking for while you're there. Um, black chin hummingbird, there was, these are kind of in order of like how many, uh, like how common they are there. So black chin, most common, broad build right behind them. There's broad-tailed hummingbirds. Those are uh, the ones with uh, kind of like a, a ruby throat. They got like the big red gorget, uh, but they're a little bit bigger, uh, I think, than uh, black chin or, or ruby throat. Um, and they'll have a little bit of uh, uh, kind of chestnut color on underneath their wing just a little bit. Rivoli's hummingbird, those are the big ones that used to be called magnificent hummingbird. Violet crowned hummingbird. Uh, they're just really long and elegant. And there's quite, there's a, like maybe two or three. I, I put two on my eBird list for violet crown, but they're pretty prominent through there. Anna's hummingbird and Rufus hummingbird are, are ones that will pop up there. Rufus, especially during migration, August will be even better for that. And then the white eared hummingbird. And then there, you know, there are some other species to maybe expect there too, like blue-throated mountain gem or calliope hummingbird. Calliope will come through uh, in migration. Uh, so barrier line hummingbird, I know, has been reported there as well as, as plain cap star throat. So just, it's just a really awesome area. This is where the, you, you'll go over this little bridge and you'll go up, go up this, uh, this little hillside up here to where the bleachers are at. So it's a nice little walk. Um, we'll do some questions on that. Actually, we can do some questions on that right now if we want, Marlene, um, okay. before we get into Ash Canyon. Okay. Um, one person wanted to know what the parking was like at Miller's Canyon. Is, is there a lot of parking there or does it fill up really quickly? Uh, so we were there pretty, pretty late. I mean, we got there, I think, like around, uh, shoot, like 10 o'clock, 9.30, and there was – ample parking there you don't have to get there super early that's a good thing about hummingbirds too and then the parking area is like angle in parking and there seem to be plenty of it there maybe about 15 spots or so 
and I was able to find parking on a Saturday morning about 9.30. So several people asked what time of day you were there. Um, yeah, yeah that, that's a really good question. And um, like I said, for hummingbirds, you, can, you don't have to be there super early, which is awesome. You can have breakfast in Sierra Vista or somewhere beforehand and then go there. Let's, let's see what time I was there. Um, uh, I'm thinking it was 930. It, it doesn't really matter, I guess, what time I was there on Saturday, but what I would say is you don't have to get there early. <laughs> I could take another question while I'm looking this up too. Okay. Um, are tripods permitted there? Mm, that's a good question. I know at Ash Canyon that we'll talk about here, um, there used to be an extra fee for that, but I'm not sure about BDs. Uh, I didn't see any tripods there. Maybe it would be good to look at their website beforehand just to check on that. And um, yeah, just check on that from their website because I'm not, I'm not positive. And what about dogs? Are they allowed on the trails? Do you know? Uh, well, so with dogs, that's a, that's a really good thing to talk about. So Tom Beatty, and I can't remember his wife's name, uh, who run Beatty's Guest Ranch, they have about eight hound dogs. And uh, Tom Jr. came up to the, um, uh, to the kind of the, the grandstand area where we were sitting with the dogs and the dogs were just running all around and were, uh, you know, I got to pet them a few times. The hummingbirds didn't seem to mind the, the dogs at all. In fact, there's a, like a little, little pond down there where they were drinking out of right in with all the hummingbird feeders. So I would not, I, I, I would not bring a dog up there because there are other dogs already there, their dogs. And I think that they don't want you to bring your dog up there. Just be mindful that there, there will be dogs there with you at different times. So just be prepared for, for that too. And then uh, uh, one other um, participant said that dogs are not allowed there according yeah. to the signs. They're not allowed. The BDs have their own dogs that you'll get to play with. <laughs> it, it really, I mean, some people might be annoyed by that. And so if, if you don't like dogs, that may not be the spot for you. They weren't up there with us the whole time as you saw the picture of my wife up there on the bleachers there were any dogs with us there but maybe for about 20 minutes there uh you know they're with us <laughs> they're beautiful hound dogs though but yeah that's all the questions we have for now luke okay cool and it does look like it was about nine it was exactly 9 30 when we were there for and we we're there for about an hour and a half this is about how many uh See three Rivoli's, twenty black chin, one broad tail, bunch of broad build, and then uh, yeah, I didn't really do much birding outside of just sitting there. We sat there almost the whole time. It was great. <laughs> All right, let's go back to uh, talk about Ash Canyon. And uh, Ash Canyon is a little bit lower in elevation, as you can see here from this. This is uh, looking into the area where you'll be sitting, you see they don't have bleachers. They have these little little chairs right here that you can sit in and uh, they're kind of scattered all around, um, especially right now as it, you can do a little bit more social distancing here than you can at Beatty's. Um, and then they, they have their hummingbird feeders all around these mesquite trees. And then if you go behind their, their house, uh, which used to be the bed and breakfast, there's a bunch of seed feeders there. So you, you'll, you don't have any seed feeders that, at Beatty's, but you do here at Ash Canyon where you're more likely to see, you know, a, a lot of other uh, species of birds, including perhaps Montezuma quail. It's one of the best spots really to photograph or to see Montezuma quail. Um, we didn't see any while we were there, but definitely an opportunity for that. This is what the parking area looks like at Ash Canyon. You just like, you go, there's probably uh, five different spots there. I've never been there when it's been full. Uh, there's always been ample parking there. There's also some parking the other direction as well. 
So, um, and we were there, uh, well, Kathy Johnson, who is on the call with us right now, we were there at the same time on Saturday and during the heat of the day, and there was tons of hummingbirds coming in. So again, not a spot you have to get there early, any time of the day. And um, uh, the hummingbird that it's most famous for, of course, is the Lucifer hummingbird. So the Lucifer looks a little bit like a black chin or a casas. You got a purple gorget here that kind of swoops back. And then, but the thing that really separates it is this long decurve bill. It's really cool to see it. Uh, it stands out. You, you might see a black chin and you're like, oh, is that, is that the Lucifer? No, uh, just when, when you see that, that decurve bill, just kind of like that, that white ear on the white eared hummingbird. It just really pops. Uh, so this is, Lucifer hummingbird is becoming more, I wouldn't say common, but more and more regular in different areas around Southeast Arizona. Box Canyon is one spot that's really good for them right now. A lot of the feeders, other feeders now in, on the east slopes of the Huachucas or also in the Chiricahuas, uh, we're getting more and more Lucifer. But still the best spot to see them is here at Ash Canyon Bird Sanctuary. I'm going to show you uh, a map of how to get in there. You would think that you would take Ash Canyon Road, but uh, I've done that before, and that's not how you get to Ash Canyon Bird Sanctuary. You take uh, a different road. It's Turkey Track Road. So I'm going to just show you. Let's roll back out of where the BDs are at. So it's a little bit further south from BDs and the Miller, Miller Canyon. So again, here's Sierra Vista right here. You come down into Sierra Vista and you go pretty far south and you're going to go to Turkey Track Road, which is down here. There it is. There's Turkey. So you can see Ash Canyon Road is down here further south. I've made the mistake. I was like, I know how to get there. I didn't take my map. Uh, this is back when I first moved here, right? So I took Ash Canyon Road. I was like, man, where is this? I thought I knew where it was at. Don't get sidetracked by, by that name. Take Turkey Track Road right here. And um, you just kind of follow it around. Follow it down here. And it turns into Spring Road. And then you just park right at the very end of that road. Again, I'll let's turn on the satellite. You can see right here at the end of Spring Road, there's like a little parking area. There'll be a sign there and you just park right there. And then there's a gate that you walk through and a little spot is $10 a person to come to Ash Canyon uh, Bird Sanctuary. Well worth it. And uh, my wife and I were there for about an hour in the heat of the day. Saw a couple different loose for hummingbirds. Uh, and uh, lots of black chin hummingbirds, lots of Anna's hummingbirds. And um, this is a really good spot possibly for plain cap star throat as well. Once we get into August, maybe later here in July, I would expect one to pop up there at some point. Oh, oops, didn't mean to stop that. Let's go back to uh, here. So some other hummingbirds to expect at Ash Canyon would be like Anna's. Like I said, that's probably the most common species there. So you sift through all the Annas to find the broad bill, black chin. Uh, there's violet crown hummingbird there as well. You know, sometimes, you know, I'm biased when I think of violet crown hummingbird. I think of the Patent Center for Hummingbirds. Like that's the spot to go for violet crown. Uh, but actually, you know, violet crown is pretty regular, both the Ash Canyon and Beatties as well. And if you're a county lister, that's a different county. So that's Cochise County. So you can add that violet crown outside of Santa Cruz, which is where Patton Center is at. Uh, but Rufus Hummingbird, you can, even though it's lower elevation, you can still get Rivoli's Hummingbirds through there. And then, um, you know, some of those uh, rare ones like Calliope, uh, very rarely in, in Allen's Hummingbird or Plain Cap Star Throat or something like that will pop up. But the thing that I like about Ash Canyon, it kind of separates it from Beatty's is a different seed feeders where you can get, you know, um, you know, other, other species like black headed grosbeak, uh, you know, different types of woodpeckers, acorn, gila, ladderback, 
white-breasted nuthatch, uh, lots of brown-headed cowbirds and lesser goldfinches. And then when you get into the winter months too, you, know, you have some other stuff. But in August, um, wild turkey, Montezuma quail, gambles quail, greater roadrunner, Cassin's kingbird, they'll all kind of show up in, in that, that spot. So before we move into going and talking about something besides hummingbirds, any questions on Ash Canyon Bird Sanctuary? Um, there was a, a, a comment that the Montezuma quail generally come out around four o'clock. Oh, that's cool. I did not know that. I would expect yet yeah, sometime there in the evening. Um, I think the caretaker there, Tim Blunt, he mentioned that uh, early morning was really good for him too. So yeah, early morning or 4 p.m. <laughs> I, I have never been there at 4 p.m. So I'm going to have to try that next time. And then um, Heather uh, said she noticed that um, so the Southeast Arizona Bird Observatory was on the map to Ash Canyon Bird Sanctuary. And is there anything to see or visit there? Yeah, so Southeast uh, Arizona Bird Observatory is the nonprofit that bought Ash Canyon Bird Sanctuary. So I believe uh, that's why the name was there. So they don't have uh, a nature, their nature center there is the Ash Canyon one. Uh, so that's uh, Sherry Williamson and Tom Wood, uh, who are amazing hummingbird people. In fact, I met Sherry back in 2009 at Beatty's. She was sitting in the bleachers next to my wife and I when we were visiting from Washington State. And it was, she's like a, a fount of knowledge. Like it was amazing to sit next to her while she was guiding someone and kind of like my wife and I listening in on her. Amazing, amazing lady. And Tom, super nice too. And, uh, so they run that, and that's why you saw the, the bird observatory there. Um, one, one more question. Yeah. Um, from someone um, like my wife and I living in Washington State, is the heat unbearable in August? Find, <laughs> is, find is, the shade. Find <laughs> the shade. Uh, you know, I mean, my wife and I were there at Ash Canyon when it was pretty hot. We were sitting in the shade, though, and it, it was it was totally fine um and up at ramsey or not ramsey at, at Beatty's, you're under the shade there, there's tons of tree cover so you're you're under the shade almost all the time there uh so that should be fine in a little higher elevation and it sierra vista area is a little bit higher as well than tucson so it's not as hot and uh, august actually isn't our hottest month june is the hottest month so if you came in june You'd have a hard time, probably, but August should be okay. That's all the questions for now, Luke. Awesome. Thanks, Marlene. Uh-huh. All right. So let's get into talking about not being hot. Uh, really, you know, another good thing that you could do in August is get up to a higher elevation where it's cooler. Um, you know, Many of us live next to the Catalina Mountains, which are not going to be open this year. And, but really, if I'm gonna go somewhere in August in the higher elevation, it's gonna be Cary Nation Trail in um, Madera Canyon in the Santa Rita Mountains. Now, if you're on the um, session with me when I talked about Madera Canyon, I mentioned this, this trail quite a bit. So I don't, I think many of you were not on that call. So it's not, and even if you were this, hopefully there'll be something new that you can get from this, but, um, the Cary Nation Trail is, it's, a, it's like a three mile round trip trail. So it's, it's a lot different than sitting in the bleachers looking at hummingbirds where, you know, it's, it's easy and uh, all physical capabilities can, can sit there and watch the hummingbirds. That, that's what kind of sets it apart and what's so great about it. But if you are able to do a little bit of a hike, this is the hike that I would do in August. In fact, I do it almost every August. There's only been uh, a year, one year, I think, where I've missed doing this hike in August. It's, it's the best. Um, it's, like I said, three miles round trip. You go to the um, end of the Madera Canyon Road to the, um, the trailhead, and it's, you take the trail that goes south, like you would be going to Mount Wrightston, but instead of turning 
uh, left onto the Mount Wrightson Trail, you just keep going straight, which would be south. And I'll show you a few pictures here. Um, but you walk up this creek uh, up to a, a little old mining shaft. And you're covered by sycamores. You get into um, a mix of pine and fir. And you can get uh, a lot of great high elevation birds up through there. And um, it's just, it's beautiful. Uh, so one of the best birds to find up there in August is the sulfur-bellied flycatcher. Uh, oftentimes you hear them before you see them. Oh, I forgot to do something. Let me stop my share real quick. And I'm going to reshare so I can have my, um, my sound on. Because the thing is, is often you, you hear these sulfur-bellied flycatchers before you see them. And I wanted to share that, that sound with you. It sounds like a, like a dog's squeaky toy. So I'm going to play this and you should be able to hear it from here. Does that sound like a dog squeaky toy? So that, that's what you want to listen for, is that, that little squeaky toy call. And they're usually high up in the sycamores. And if you can get a, cool, a, a good look at them in the sun, you can see they got a really rusty tail. They got this, the reason they're called sulfur bellies, they got this yellow wash that goes over the, it's kind of their brown streaked breast. And uh, these white and brown uh, facial markings. It's a really awesome flycatcher that only comes up into this area of the United States. They come, they migrate really late, so they don't show up until about mid to late May, and then they'll stick around through the end of August, first part of September. Uh, but it's one of the, the birds I'm always looking for when I head up there. As you walk up the, the trail, you'll go past the, the turnoff for um, Mount Wrightson, and then there'll be a little bench so even if you don't want to walk the full three miles, you know, mile and a half out, mile and a half back, uh, it is a little steep the first part, but if you just go up to where this bench is at, just past the turnoff for Mount Wrightston, you'll also see this, this sign right here that says Mount Wrightston Wilderness. But sit at that bench, and that's a great spot for a uh, sulfur-bellied flycatcher. That's also where oftentimes I've had elegant trogan, and you'll have painted red starts through there. So you don't necessarily even have to do uh, that, that uh, this full hike right here either. So really the bench is probably like a right, right around in here. And you can just sit there and uh, forego the rest of it. <laughs> but if you're able to do that, that, full, uh, that full walk, it's a trail that kind of looks like this and it, it winds along this creek bed. Here's some other species to look for. Uh, of course, elegant trogan is probably my favorite spot for trogan in August, but pygmy owl, tons of painted red starts, tons of black throated gray warblers in migration in August, Arizona woodpecker, red faced warblers. Uh, I want to share with you um, uh, what a typical eBird list will look like from there in August. So, as you can see here, see I went, uh, I went in July this year in June, and then 2019 in August, 2018 in August, 2016 in August. So let's see what we saw last year, August 19th. It's actually my wedding anniversary, so I went with my wife, and she, that's the first day that she got a her eBird list going. Even got my wife eBirding, and uh, so here's what you would typically see in a mid-August walk up Cary Nation. Uh, Bantail pigeons possible, but as you can see, uh, lots of different flycatchers, Western Wood Peewee, Dusky Cat Flycatcher, the Sulphur Belly, Cordieran. But the cool thing here is all of these warblers, there's, if you walk down to the end, you'll see a, a mine shaft and there's a, a spring right there that's uh, always has water, even right now, 
early July, there's water right there. And it's a cool spot for dragonflies, butterflies through there. But almost always I run into a good mixed flock in that area. And as you can see, there is, we had one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten species of warblers, which is really good for Western United States. Um, but it's, that's where you want to spend some time. There's like a camping area right there too, that if you want to backpack in there and camp for the night, probably be a really good spot for um, maybe Mexican spotted owl or um, whiskered screech owl, those types of things. Uh, if you go there early in the morning, you have a chance for Northern pygmy owl. So we always start pretty early, like around 6.30. Um, and let's see, let's see what time we started in 2018. Oh, 9.24, we actually started later. Oh, I was with my son. That's why we started later, because he didn't want to wake up as early. But as you can see, like, uh, see quite a few warblers through here too, graces. And always lots of painted red starts. And then look for bears. That's the other thing you want to look for, of course, when you're going up Cary Nation is bears. Um, Especially, seems like the summertime is, is really good to see them up there. Um, so, Marlene, any questions on Cary Nation Trail? Um, well, Kate wanted to know if you do all three spots in one day. Um, not Cary Nation with the hummingbirds. So, that's a really good question. So, like, if I was doing a day trip, I would do one day trip just for Beatties and Ash Canyon together. You could theoretically go maybe first thing in the morning to like the San Pedro house, which is along the San Pedro River, just east of Sierra Vista. Bird there in the morning because you don't want to be there when it's hot. Um, so bird that like that San Pedro house area and then go to the hummingbird spots later on during the day. So that would be one full day. And then Cary Nation Trail, Madera Canyon would be a totally different day. Uh, they're separated by uh, quite a distance. It's about an hour and a half to Sierra Vista, Beatties, Ash Canyon from Tucson. Cary Nation Trail and the trailhead in Madera is about an hour from, from Tucson, just to give you an idea of, of uh, how far away. And then um, do you know what camera lens range um, would be recommended for the Ash Canyon Trail? Uh, for Ash Canyon Bird Sanctuary, you're going to have the hummingbird and the other birds of the feeders pretty close to you. So I don't know that much about cameras. I just use a little um, uh, Canon PowerShot SX50. I just have it on auto all the time. So I don't really know that much about cameras, but I know that they're the birds are pretty close. So uh, you don't have to have anything real fancy, I don't think. Um, that's the great spot about these feeding locations. Not only do you not have to, you know, go walk or hike or anything, you can just go right there and then the birds are just so close. And my wife, who's not really a birder and doesn't really use binoculars very often, she was uh, just talking about how she was able to see the markings on the hummingbirds without her binoculars and how she just loved that. It's a great spot to take someone who's not really a birder but is kind of on the fence and it helps make them a birder. <laughs> That's what I found anyways. And then Carl wanted to know if you have any tips on locating owls on the trail. Yeah, so during the day uh, you won't it, it's, it's pretty much dumb luck uh, finding an owl during the day on a roost. Uh, I have found spotted owls walking that trail before, and the best thing to do is uh, the owls will be uh, roosting near the trunk. So most of the time, owls won't be way out on the branches. You look for weird shaped clumps next to the trunks of trees. And every once in a while, you'll find a real owl instead of like a clump, <laughs> which is mostly what I find. But every once in a while, it'll be a real owl. Now, if you go there at dusk, one thing that my son and I love to do, but we usually do this more 
in like April or May is we'll go and park at the end of that that Madera Canyon Road in the parking lot and we'll just walk up to where that bench is at which is about 0.3 miles 0.2 0.3 miles from the the trailhead uh right after where the the trail goes up to Mount Ryston there's that little bench and we'll go and we'll sit at that bench right at dusk and we'll um We'll just sit there and wait for it to be dark. We'll take flashlights with us. And inevitably what happens is the Mexican whippoorwills start calling, whiskers, screech owls start calling. And sometimes you can use your um, flashlight to pinpoint where they're calling from. And uh, normally I don't take pictures of owls. We use the flashlights. I just don't like bothering them that much. Mostly just take in the sounds and that's good enough for me. Um, but um, sitting there, waiting for them to call, and then maybe pinpointing their location from there would be a fun way of doing it. Uh, there's also an elf owl that I think uh, they're done uh, with their breeding season right near Santa Rita Lodge that uh, many people take the time to, uh, uh, to, to check out that elf owl there at the Santa Rita Lodge. And there's one more question. Um, are there mosquitoes in the area? You know, um, here in Southeast Arizona, we don't have that much of a problem with mosquitoes, thankfully. Where I've had the biggest problem, and it has been in August, September, is along the Danza Trail, which is uh, like two back uh, uh, and along the Santa Cruz River, the trail that goes along there. Um, late August, you'll get a lot of mosquitoes through there. But up in the higher elevations, they don't, they don't seem to bother me. Um, but what does bother me sometimes when I'm out walking around are, are the little ant piles that I accidentally stand on. Mm -hmm. So one way you can uh, fight back with those ants is just putting some spray around your ankles and stuff that also help with chiggers. But mostly in those higher elevations, uh, I haven't had any issues with, with the bugs, mostly lower elevation. Okay, that's all the questions. Cool. All right. So we got a few more minutes here. I'm going to take us into the other thing about August, which is shorebird migration. Most people don't think of Southeast Arizona as a hot spot for shorebirds. These are western sandpipers right here from uh, Cochise Lake near Wilcox. But the one reason why uh, big days in August are so good around here is that this is when we have an explosive, uh, explosion of shorebirds that come through uh, to different wastewater treatment plants, uh, different areas with mud, and especially uh, Cochise Lake around Wilcox. So this is a, a picture right here of, of uh, Cochise Lake uh, in Wilcox, which is about an hour and 15 minutes from Tucson, hour and a half, depending on where you live. Um, but really, it's a, it's a really fun spot to come, go in, and check out. Again, you don't necessarily need to be there first thing in the morning. Although, as you can see here, what do you not see around here? This picture. I don't see any trees. <laughs> no trees, no shade. It's sunny. So, um, uh, if you are there during the heat of the day, just be mindful that uh, you will be getting blazed on by the sun. So getting there in the morning is is nice, but you don't necessarily need to be there first thing in the morning. Oh, but I, I would say also, uh, if you're going there to take pictures, um, it is better to be there in the morning. The, the light is best uh, for photography early in the morning. So just be aware of that. Um, there's a lot of other places to check out for shorebirds around here. Uh, Abra Valley Wastewater Treatment Plant out in uh, West Tucson, Amato and Canoa Ranch as you go down towards Green Valley. Uh, Kerp San Lina Park is right here in Tucson, kind of like South Tucson off the of Country Club. There can be some good spots for shorebirds through there. Uh, La Mirage Sewage Treatment uh, is um, in Marana. So that can, that's a very, it's not a very well-known little wastewater treatment plant, uh, but you could look up the La, 
uh, Mirage um, hotspot in Eburn and see the directions for there. It's pretty, pretty easy, uh, but lots of black neck stilts there. Benson Sue's treatment pond as you head towards Wilcox, it's always a fun little spot to, to stop at. But if you're gonna, if you wanna find some shorebirds around here, August is gonna be the month and Lake Cochise is the place to go. You'll have hundreds of American avocets. You'll have hundreds of Wilson's fowler oaks. You'll have maybe a hundred black neck stilts. You'll have Baird sandpipers and Western sandpipers and Lee sandpipers and the scores, you know, 20, 40, 60, 80 of those. Uh, long billed curlews, redneck fowler oaks, lesser yellow legs are other expected species. And there's just lots of weird things that show up there. This is a willet over here in the bottom right. But you can see things from like marble godwit to a uh, stilt sandpiper, maybe maybe a red fowler rope, um, and dowitchers, long bill, maybe a short bill dowitcher goes through there. Wimbrel might be something to look for. This is a kind of a bad Google map of the area, but I just wanted, so actually here, I'm gonna, before I show this one to you, I'm gonna go to a new share real quick and let's go to this, Google Maps. So just to give you an overview of where that's at, I say some people may not know where Wilcox is at in relation to everything. So you can see Tucson over here on our left and you just take I-10, all the way over to Wilcox over here on the right. And as you go into Wilcox, you'll go through Rex Allen Drive. This is like the main drag. And then you'll take a right on Haskell. There's a, there's a um, stoplight right here. And you just take a left of that stoplight. And you follow signs for, you'll see golf course signs. You also see a birding this way sign. See, so you, you go down, you'll see the border patrol station. You'll drive by all that. And as you come down into this area, this is Lake Cochise. There's a golf course here. This is an awesome area for scaled quail as well. Uh, so get there early in the morning for scaled quail. But this is how you get into the lake. And then uh, like that map I've shown here in the PowerPoint, you'll, this is a golf course up here at the top. You come down this road, and um, this is like a dirt road that goes around here. One thing I would caution you, if it rained recently, these roads through here get super muddy. It's like a clay, and it'll cake up your wheels. So if, it, if it's muddy at all, if you have any, any thought that, oh, th this road doesn't look good, don't take it. Like, just walk out there, don't drive on it, because there's been a lot of people who've gotten their car stuck through here. But if it's dry, any car can do it, whether it's a sedan or a truck or, or whatever. Um, but so what you'll do is you drive here and there's a little loop that goes around this whole, this whole lake and you can stop at different points. Uh, this usually has this nice little spit right here where you, you see uh, quite a few shorebirds and then this uh, western little section right here can be really good as well. One thing you don't want to neglect is after you kind of tour around here, you take this park in this little spot right here, there will be a little overlook into these ponds. Uh, but you can walk down here and usually these ponds right here can be really good for shorebirds as well. Maybe sometimes even better depending on the water levels, how much mud there is, but especially this pond right here that's just south of the golf course can be really good. So make sure to check that area. And then there's a little willow clump of willow trees right here. And oftentimes there'll be black crown night herons that'll be sticking right in there as well. So check those areas out. Don't, don't neglect that. But um, yeah, this shore birding in August is, is the second best thing or third best thing next to uh, Hummingbirds and Cary Nation Trail. Any questions on, on the shorebird stuff? Um, yeah, up? there was a few questions um, yeah. about the sandhill cranes, but then somebody oh, yeah. 
when they will be here. Yeah, so Sandhill Cranes will not be here in August, unfortunately. They're, they're a wintering one that'll come in late October, November. And you, November is usually about a good time to start seeing them come through. And they'll stick around until late February or early March. And this is the area where um, the, uh, you know, the Wilcox, Wings Over Wilcox Festival does a lot of field trips into this area. And uh, most of the time, you won't see a lot of cranes on this big lake here. You'll mostly see them out over here um, in these ponds over here. Uh, so if you're there in the winter, you know, you don't see the main lake. Well, don't forget to look over here, uh, uh, kind of just on the edge of the golf course. Um, and then are the scale quail, um, do they live at the lake or at the golf course? So both. Actually, most of the time where I see them is like right when you're coming into the golf course area. I, I've seen them on the golf course before, uh, but there's some like, there's like a little golf course uh, building right here where you check in and like some machinery, usually just to the south of where that little house is at. And I've seen them often walking around that machinery and you can, if you park here to kind of walk this road, uh, this whole area right here next to the parking area, and then also down here on this road is probably the, the number one spots where I would check. Um, and then um, the last, you had a list of, of shorebirds and uh, yep. the very last one on that list, um, somebody wanted to know what that one was. Oh, well, um, there's lesser yellow lakes, which is kind of like this still, they're not still Sam, uh, kind of like the Willet, except it has yellow legs and a shorter bill, thinner bill, much thinner bill. Uh, and then the, the last one, there's lots of rarity. So um, mm -hmm. just like lots of weird birds will come through there, not just shore birds, but terns, gulls, um, maybe uh, uh, late August can be a good time for. Um, kind of post breeding dispersal of different herons like tricolored heron or roseate spoonbill. So those are different things we'll look for there too. And that's all the questions, Lou. Okay, cool, cool. All right, so last thing, rare bird of the month, Aztec thrush. This bird right here is why I walk Cary Nation Trail every time, every year in August and July because July, August, September is gonna be the time of year when Aztec thrushes will come up from Mexico if they ever do again. And they're gonna see these berries right here. This is, they're gonna be feeding on these berries. And uh, the San Marino Mountains and Cary Nation Trail historically have been a spot to find these guys as they come up. Uh, there haven't been very many reports of them in recent years, but when they do come up, it's usually late summer. And so this is probably the most wanted bird for me, even more so than eared quetzal, which I still haven't seen the eared quetzal. But Aztec thrush in August in the Santa Rita Mountains, so whether it's Cary Nation Trail or um, Vault Mine Trail or Agua Caliente Saddle or going up to um, Josephine Saddle or Kent Spring Trail. One of these August, there's going to be an Aztec thrush there. This picture was taken by uh, Brandon Mulrooney. This is actually up Cary Nation Trail, where this picture is from. So if any of you find this Aztec thrush, first thing you should do is email me. <laughs> Luke, do you know what kind of berries those are? Uh, Yes, it's on the tip of my tongue, and for some reason I can't remember. It's um, not a hackberry, it's... Um, wolfberry? No, not wolfberry. It's something that, that's at higher elevations. Oh. It'll come to me later. <laughs> I'll put it in the... I'll, I'll look it up just to confirm before I say something that, that's wrong. Oh, yeah, um, I wanted to know if it's pyracantha. <sighs> I, I don't think it's pyracantha. It's something similar to that, though. <laughs> ah, I, 
I should have looked that up beforehand. I'll put it in the notes afterwards. Yeah. So one last thing to think about for August birding. Some of these are repeats from July, you know, plan for afternoon monsoons. Be careful with the muddy areas. Start in the morning, bring water. But the big thing here is just consider that many birds have worn feathers late in the season. They're molting into their non-breeding plumage, so they're not going to be as bright. They may be missing some feathers. And so, and there's going to be some juvenile birds out there, which makes identification a little bit more difficult, a little bit harder. But just take your time. You're going to see some birds that, that will look a little different. Uh, it's a great time to test out uh, some of your ID skills. You know, think about not just color, but about shape of the bird, uh, their bill shape, what their behavior is like, what kind of habitat they're in, those types of things. Um, so just be aware there's gonna be, a, could be some weird uh, looking birds out there that are missing feathers or just not as bright as you would expect them to be. So with that being said, any last questions? Um, no. Oh, Marie asks, uh, can Tucson Audubon do presentation on juvenile IDs? IDs, yeah. Woo, that would be, <laughs> yeah, that, that's, that would mean I need to call in Homer Hansen or someone like that. Because mm -hmm. um, I'm still learning, well, we're all still learning. Even Homer would say he's, he's still learning. Um, but yeah, that, that, I like that idea. Thanks for that idea. Marie, appreciate that. And let's see. Lots yeah. of thank yous. <laughs> Lots of thank yous are good. Uh, I, I appreciate that. Um, it's always fun to, to do these talks. I'm already thinking about September and uh, trying to ho hold off on talking about some areas until they're, they are the best. So hopefully you get to Cary Nation or um, to BDs or Ash Canaan. I love to hear from people who actually go to these spots after we talk about them. A lot of people went to Los Cienegas after the July, uh, where to go birding in July, and lots of uh, great comments there. And thanks, uh, Deb, brought that up. How is Los Cienegas in August? It's good too. It's good too. Um, you know, the same, same uh, sort of things that we talked about for July apply there. Uh, Casting sparrows and bodery sparrows will be seen after the monsoons that they they're breeding uh, through that time. Yellow billed cuckoos will still be through there. Uh, you know, migration will start kicking up. So when you're at Empire Gulch, you'll see um, begin to see uh, some post breeding dispersal. So maybe painted buntings through there. Oh, cool. Um, so hey, what's yeah. the what's we saw? I saw a uh, Peggy and I who's with me here. Uh, we saw this weird, like it looked like a really large woodpecker was a flicker, I'm pretty sure. And it had like orange wings on the ground foraging. What the heck is kind of flicker yeah, would that be? It's probably a, a red, orange, like yeah, a, like a red-shafted northern flicker. So the, the, color, the color on those flickers can, um, just like on any bird, can kind of vary a little bit. Okay. You know, like when you think of a house finch, you can see some that are like, Whoa, super bright red, mm -hmm. another one that's kind of pale red or orange. And so that's the same thing that happens with the northern flickers too, that, that yeah. red. He was really, or she was, which I, we, I couldn't tell what it was, female or male, but it was really loud. I thought it was a hawk. Then it was just jumping around the, the ground and we thought it was her, but it was like foraging. I got a picture of it with the, I got a great picture of it. Also, just real quick, I know this is all birders, but the week before I went to with another ma uh, master naturalist and we saw a herd of pronghorn with babies and then you guys got to go check out the black tail prairie dogs. So, and there was, <laughs> so, and there were a lot of good birds around there, but the little prairie dogs were out and there was also a pronghorn uh, hanging out there. Yeah. A few weeks ago. So, so it's kind of, yeah, it's, it's really a neat little area. So, yeah, we can't forget about the mammals. Yes. The, the, so along, along with that last, maybe uh, another thing I'll share about August is that it's amazing for butterflies and dragonflies, especially butterflies. 
like if uh, you're walking along uh, the Cary Nation Trail or maybe Florida Canyon or any you know, Sycamore Canyon, any canyon with water that's going through it, you're going to have tons of butterflies lining the stream bed. And uh, so bring your butterfly book, take pictures of the butterflies. Don't, don't forget about those guys that are hanging oh. out there. Luke, um, Debbie had her hand raised. Oh yeah, go ahead, Debbie. I have a question about more detail from the Cary Nation Trail. So you head up like that 0.8 miles and you're along the creek. Um, and then it kind of curves off to the right and heads up the, yep. the is it worthwhile going doing that loop like where are you headed if you go up that way and are you walking out of the birdie area or is there more to see as you go up so there's a couple spots where it does that so i just want to make sure we're talking about the same spot are you talking about before the mine or after the mine after okay yeah so you get to the mine you see this uh, this mine shaft here wh while I'm talking about that I think what I'll do is um, I have that I'll look for that mine shaft picture too so we can all uh, see you guys can see what it looks like if you want but that trail so it's not to go up from that mine shaft and you it gets even steeper mm -hmm. so Debbie you, you know that that yeah. that main carnation trail is already pretty steep but it gets even steeper as you wind your way up there. And you'll get up in the higher elevation there into like really thick fir trees. And I did do that the other last month. And there's a Northern Gossock family that's up there. Hmm. That, uh, so Northern Gossock, Pygmy Nuthatch uh, are a couple species that are hard to get on the, the main Cary Nation Trail, but as, as you go up to try to hook up with the Agua Caliente Trail or anything like that, you get into some different habitat for that. Otherwise, most of the birds are about the same, but what I, when I would do that section is in the winter, when uh, eared quetzal are more likely to show up, like November, December, January is a good time for eared quetzal. And so that habitat up there is really good for, for ear quetzal. Okay. Now I would say that the trail becomes a little hard to navigate different places as you work your way up to Agua Caliente Trail. And actually, uh, I I didn't get lost, but I did kind of kind of lose track of where I was at a few times there at, at okay. different times. <laughs> so uh, it, yeah, just stay on the. Trail. Ellen, you should be all right. All right, thanks. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, we started to explore that once and uh, just got a little unsure about where we were headed. Yeah, that's normal. I Last time I did it, I had it done for a while and I was a little unsure as well. So, okay. <laughs> um, so I don't know, can you guys see uh, this picture of the shaft, the mine shaft? Yes. Okay, yeah, so that, that's kind of, Kind of what it looks like you can see a little bit of water there this is in early july so kind of the driest point but this in front of this it opens up into more of a creek and i actually did have a friend who came around the corner to this mine shaft and there's a big black bear sitting right next to this rock <laughs> them a little bit um so just be aware of the bears up there <laughs> debbie knows about that um Luke, yep. Is it worthwhile going to Lake Cochise any other month besides August? Oh yeah, uh, August is the best. April, April and May are really good too. You get you know that spring uh, migration for shorebirds. I think fall is a little better, uh, but um, but spring is good too. And then of course in the winter when the sandhill cranes are there, it can be a good spot for sandhill cranes. And so uh, whenever I, I kind of make it a point that every time that I travel east and I'm going by there, I usually make it at least like a little 15 or 20 minute stop to check things out because you never know. I mean, it's like the main big body of water anywhere around there. So if there's 
some sort of weird rare turn or gull or shorebird is probably going to be there. Always a good spot to stop. Not too far off the road. All right. I think that's well, hey. it. Okay, cool. I'm going to mute everyone. I'll kind of stick around here a little bit if anyone else has questions. Uh, thanks so much for, for joining us. And um, yeah, have a great rest of your week. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Don't yeah. forget, it's Moth Week. Moth Week? Yeah. If you guys did the Moth webinar, it's Moth Week this week. Oh. I did it. I, I didn't forget that it was Moth Week because I didn't know that it was Moth Week. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he mentioned it in the Moth webinar that okay. he did a couple, uh, several weeks ago. Oh, good memory. So he's actually doing um, another, like, two more webinars this week. And then... Okay. I'll have to check in with Jeff on that. This is Judy in Green Valley. We've got a lot of mosquitoes. <laughs> uh, yeah, you know, that's true. Um, so we used to have like a, we had an old swimming pool in our backyard. Uh -huh. And before I drilled out the bottom of it, make it more into a garden area, uh -huh. it was collecting uh, water. Yeah. We would have a big mosquito problem at our house. Yeah. And so I, I fixed that. Um, but yeah, so if there is standing water, especially in the lower elevations like Tucson, Green Valley, Tubac area, there will be mosquitoes. Yep. Yeah, they've been pretty ornery. But they'll go away in August. So. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's good to see you, Judy. What's that? Good to see you, Judy. Yeah, I'm happy to be here. I'll have to get the first part of it because I was a little late. But. Oh, yeah. We'll send a... Yeah. Thank you. Yep. Someone else have a question? I thought I heard someone. Yeah. Yeah, Luke, can you yeah. hear me? This yeah. is Vaughn. Um, hey, Vaughn. It's a little out of the area, but would Mount Graham be an acceptable substitute for Mount Lemon? It's a, it's a much longer drive. Yeah. That's for sure. Um, yeah, I talked about Mount Lemon a little bit when we were talking uh, back in June and some of the higher elevation sky islands around here. And um, Mount Graham is underburdened so there aren't as many you don't have a lot to go from as to uh, where the best spots are at but there are uh, and there was a big burn up there maybe about six years ago five years ago something like that um, there's one camping area called Acadia I think it's called Acadia campground and I've had uh, lead faced warblers there um, I think that someone else has had like Mexican spotted owl there, but there's good um, Mex you know Mexican species that we think of uh, in in the in that mountain range as well. Uh, Short-tailed hawk could be a possibility up there. That's kind of more like late spring, but um, I would say heading up there and checking it out would be totally worthwhile. And look for the red squirrels up there, uh, but kind of an, an endangered uh, squirrel that was um, kind of put on the brink of extinction because of the fire that was there. And but they're starting to make a recovery. So look for the red squirrels. Sounds good. Thanks. Yeah. All right. I'm going to head out. Thanks so much for joining us. And I'll see you around again soon, hopefully. Take care. Bye bye. Yep.